My name is Tony Little. I'm the, I'm the headmaster of Eton College. Achievement means many things to many people. I see it meaning that any person should have the confidence to be themselves and to be able to go beyond themselves. And that is the fundamental aspect of any achievement that anybody ever makes in life. I was born in a place called Hillingdon, now a London borough, so not very far from here, in fact. It's a West London suburb, pretty nondescript, the kind of place where all the houses look the same. And my parents were created a good, loving home, so I was very fortunate in that regard. My father was a security guard at Heathrow, and my mother did some part-time secretarial work at the local hospital. So it was a pretty normal family upbringing. I don't think the expectations were ever articulated. They weren't ambitious, driven parents. But I think there was a tacit expectation that we in the family, we should take the opportunities that we had. I think of the two, my mother was more obviously ambitious. And in my experience, that is often the case. It's very often the mother that is the one with the ambition for children. Well, my, my educational route, I went to the local state primary school a very good school, a ch little Church of England primary school, where I think I was well taught in the basics and the fundamentals. I was also, as a small boy, singing in the local church choir. And the choir mistress there, a Miss Rolls, splendid lady, she was aware that there were opportunities for boys to audition to go to the choir school that used to exist at that time at Eton College. This was when I was age nine. And my mother thought this was a good idea, so I trooped along here and had to sing and take some tests, academic tests, at the age of nine. And for four years, I went to the choir school at Eton and was very fortunate then, at the age of 13, to be offered a, a scholarship to stay on at Eton in the main school until the age of 18. Then I went to, to university, I went to Cambridge, where I, at that time, thought I might be a lawyer, so I started reading law. And I read law at Cambridge for slightly less than 36 hours, which I like to think was a distinguished, even if rather short, legal career. I decided that there could be a lifetime of the law, so I wanted simply to read something I wanted to read. So I was allowed to change to read English, and I read novels and plays and poetry, which I very much enjoyed. And at the end of that time, I decided that I really didn't want to go into the law. And because I was involved with people who happened to be doing teacher training for the first time, I started thinking that teaching might be a good way, in a rather selfish way, I have to say, to enjoy the things that I had done up to that point. It's selfish. It's selfish in the sense that uh, I really enjoyed English literature, so I could, and I enjoyed plays, producing them and acting them. I was quite sporty. I enjoyed staying fit and being involved with sport. I could do all these things and someone would pay me. I fully accept the word worthy of notion that the child is the father of the man, that we are hugely influenced and shaped by our upbringings, the conditions of our birth, but I refuse to accept that that predetermines or dictates the way our lives lead. And that's why I'm in education, because I believe education it has the, is the powerful means by which people can change direction and have choice and do the things that fulfil them. Since every young person has the right, in my view, to have choices so that they can define for themselves their path, not one that has been written for them by parents, or expectations of other people within the broader family. So it doesn't matter who you are, whatever your background. Sometimes people from more privileged backgrounds, young people can feel more constrained by expectation of families, that they must go down a particular route. And the discovery that there is altogether a different route that they wish is often quite a difficult <laughs> moment for them. It really quite, uh, quite traumatic on occasion. So I think that's one aspect of it. But I also feel, in a, in a school like Eton, bearing in mind we have boys these days who come from a wide variety of backgrounds. We have a lot of boys from relatively modest backgrounds, like my own, or from families where there is no tradition of education at all. I'm the first person in my family to go into a sixth form in a school, let alone 
go to a university. It, there was just no expectation or understanding of the academic world at all. And there are plenty of other boys like that here. So Eton's an unusual place because we have the sons of people who live in castles, but we also have the sons of people who live in tower blocks in London. It's really quite an interesting mix. But it doesn't matter whatever background the boys have come from, by virtue of being at Eton, it is a tremendous privilege. And I think everyone here is conscious of that. And it's a privilege because of the range of options that young people have. So you're a 13 year old, a 15 year old, a 16 year old. The exposure you have to a wide range of different cultural activities, to games, to people who come and speak, the, the richness of the culture is extraordinary. It's the kind of thing I would wish for every child in the country. It's a very individual business. Of that I am sure you're quite right. And what is an achievement for one person may not seem to be the similar style of achievement, similar type of achievement to somebody else. You know, we all have our different perspectives. But I want to come back to explain this by looking at the phrase that I used earlier, which is that young people need to be themselves. Because they need to learn to be themselves. And one of the things I think I have learned in all the years I have been involved in education is that we use this rather trivial language of being yourself. It was all a bit, you know, 1960s, flower, you know, be yourself, hang out and all the rest of it. I don't mean that at all. That's a very lib way of going about it. Learning to be yourself is a pretty hard-edged thing. Finding out who you are. When you go through adolescence, when identity is a very fluid concept, the business of finding out what really makes you tick and what you are as a person is a complex thing and sometimes quite a painful activity for young people to go through. You know, we, part of my job, what we do as teachers and parents too, I hope, is help young people learn who they are, find out who they are. Because once you have that, then I think you give people, young people, a true sense of self-worth. And in my view, that is the absolute essential building block for anything else that is achieved or accomplished in later life. There are some people that get to be adults and they still don't know who they are. Huh? What advice would you give someone like that? <laughs> That's a very interesting question and it's a tricky one to answer. Any answer is likely to sound glib. But I think the when I use this phrase, learning to be who you are, it is playing upon some pretty basic truths of human existence to do with honesty, integrity, and purpose. And I think an awful lot of our muddled social living, the way society works, muddies those very basic things. So what we all need to do, it doesn't matter if you're an adolescent or you're a 60-year-old, is seek clarity on those basic human qualities and attributes, like integrity, for example. Now, be quite sharp and clear-headed about it. I mean, to put it in rather a glib way, one of the things I sometimes say to boys when it comes up in conversation is, you may get away with kidding other people, but if you get used to kidding yourself, then you're in real trouble. 